so good to be here this morning to bring God's word to us today. Wonderful to see all of you and the music team. Thank you. That was a treat. That was a special treat, especially from you too. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. They just added to an already awesome team, which was really good. We are back on the Sermon on the Mount. After taking a break last week where Luke and Naomi came and they shared with us both what God is doing in the mission field, but also what God is inviting us in our hearts. Now, maybe it's because of that thing we say, you know, save the best for last kind of feeling. I just felt like, man, every time missionaries come and they share what happens in the mission field, I feel like they were so good. But this one, I feel like they were my favorites. I was so blessed and encouraged. If you missed last week's message that Luke spoke, please Check it out on YouTube, you will be encouraged and you will be very challenged. It was amazing. But today, back to the Sermon on the Mount. And I have a question for you, all right? Now imagine with me, just think, put on your wild imagination cups, and that God, uh, if he were to decide to employ an image consultant to sort of like help improve his perception among the people because he's realized all of a sudden he's become quite unpopular and people don't quite you know take to him and now he wants advice on how he could change his image and become a bit more popular what are some of the suggestions you think the consultant should give God just just throw them out just get some different <laughs> Some different clothes. Not a big white gown. Not a big white gown that makes him look like he's far from us and we don't can't identify with him. Like yeah. Just look like more like yeah. Stop talking about sin. Stop talking about yeah, sin. Like yeah. what? I mean, why? Yeah. Yeah, it's just too much. Why? Why should he? Why should he? Yeah. What else can God do to just sort of like look a bit better and get more access? Second's church. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness, yeah, I can see, I can see some people will not be very popular in this one, you know. Yeah. You know, I, I can imagine there would, I mean, if you were to take an opinion from outside there and just say, guys, let's give God some advice about how he would look better, we would have plenty to say. You know, let's, 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 you know, God, just get a bit serious. Let's, your rules, can we talk about them? Can we be, you know, less rigid about some things? And God, did you ever realize we are pro-choice here? This thing about you being the only way, can we talk about that? Can we like give options? Because this is our generation or why that health thing you talk about in the Bible? I mean, life would be so much better if no one ever talked about health. I mean, why is it even there? I mean, God, surely, do you think this makes you look more popular? Let's, let's get rid of that part of the Bible that talks about these things. And, and if you could also show some muscle against Satan, you know, we, we would appreciate it because he seems to be on the winning side on this side of life, we would probably have plenty to say, isn't it? Now, let's hold that thought. Because Jesus came to introduce us to a kingdom of God, and he had plenty to say, and boy, was it unpopular. See, on the Sermon on the Mount, if we are just to have this broad look at what Jesus did, he came and said, I have a message of how to be blessed. And it is a peculiar way. It is an upside down way of getting blessed. And, and by the way, if, if you want to be effective in my kingdom, you need to be the light and the salt. Like you need to be the ones who are affecting change, not the ones sitting down to be changed. Just give. And I know the world wants you to be moral. And morality is a good thing. Everyone celebrates that. Jesus says, I don't want morality. I'm asking for holiness. Because morality says, thou shalt not murder. But Jesus says, I come to tell you, if you even hate your brother, you have sinned. That's holiness. Morality says, you shall not commit adultery. But holiness, it says something different. Even if you look at somebody lustfully, you have already sinned against them. Morality says, you know, when somebody hurts you, be fair. Don't hurt them back too much. Just be equal. 
give an eye for an eye. That's justice. That's morality. Jesus says, I'm calling you to holiness. Where somebody who hates you, you love them. If they persecute you, you pray for them. I am calling you to something so radically different. And if you want to have a posture of power, don't gather, don't amass for yourself, give and give generously. And by the way, um, consider that the greatest reward you to ever look forward to is not anything you will get here, but the one in heaven. And then it goes like, how do you like that? <laughs> you see, Jesus' kingdom in the Sermon on the Mount was not a popular one. He introduced something that made you realize that all you need is nothing close to what the world has said but Christ alone. Just him alone. And that should not make you feel sad. In fact, that should make you feel so blessed and so excited that when you have things on this world that you're not gaining and you're like, but I know heaven is going to be good. Some of us, you know, have this gloomy face thinking heaven is going to be good. That's the only thing I can hold up. Jesus like, rejoice. Grasp that with courage and goodness and joy and celebrate that great is your reward in heaven. And so the message Jesus gives is intense. It is C.S. Lewis who said once that he who has Christ and the whole world has no more than he who has Christ alone. And Jesus came to say, Whatever you think you could gain that is bigger than the kingdom of heaven, I just want you to know, if you have me, if you have the kingdom of heaven, then you've got it all. Can you rejoice in that? Then two weeks ago, Gavin came and brought us the message of knock, ask, and give. And that's where we left off this sermon. And what I find interesting is that sometimes it's easy to think of those words as easy, but Gavin reminded us something so important that Jesus didn't just say ask. In fact, the word says keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. Now, this kingdom is not quite nice. Why do I have to keep asking? God, can't I ask once and you provide in advance so that I'm just fully sufficiently supplied? But God wants us to keep asking and keep seeking and keep knocking on the door. God, why can't you just open the door? You already know I need to enter. Just why do I have to keep? And God says, because this is the way. I need this to be a relationship of trust. Live a life trusting me. Live a life trusting me. And Jesus doesn't stop there. He brings us to where we are going to be landing on today from Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. And when you look from that portion of scripture all the way to the end of the Sermon of the Mount, now Jesus is wrapping up this sermon. And I want you to imagine yourself as one of the people in the crowds, thousands, masses seated there. This is different from the other places where he's probably talking just to the disciples. And you can be like, those disciples, they just don't listen, do they? Or the Pharisees, and you can be like, yeah, we always know the Pharisees don't listen. And it can be about them. But this time, it's the crowds. It's the Pharisees, it's the disciples, it's the people who've had something about Jesus, it's the people who've had nothing, it's the people who've expected who have not expected, people who are following him already, people who are not sure whether to follow him. Imagine yourself in that crowd. What would you hear as Jesus is speaking to you? And so as he wraps up his message, Jesus says, now that you know what my kingdom is, it's time to make a choice. Will you come in or will you not? Will you choose me or will you choose something else? And so we read Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 to 14. <coughs> so this is what it says. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow. And the way is hard that leads to life. And those that find it are few. 
Let me pray. Father, we thank you for the listening and the hearing of your word. Hard as it is, this word is life. And I just pray that you will open our hearts to hearing that which you have in store for us. And more than that, Lord, let our hearts yield to you, O giver of life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There are four areas of tools that Jesus invites us to look at, and I want us to just open this place and see. There are two ways or two paths that Jesus gives. There are two groups or two groups of people that are in the story. There are two gates, and there are two destinations. Please hear that there's no third one. And this is an invitation to choose one or the other, and there is no abstaining from choosing. A non-choice is not acceptable. You have to choose one or the other. And so let me start with the two parts that Jesus is inviting us to look at. Jesus says that this path, one of them is wide. And the wide path is easy. And many people take that path. Because it's easy. After all, it's easy. Who does not want to take the easy path? But the second one is a different one. It is narrow, but it is also hard. Now, the word that is used for hard is not just something that is a little difficult. It's something that you can only achieve by striving by serious strife. It's agonizing, it's a path that is marked with suffering, a road that is marked with hardship and sorrow. And so it is not surprising that Jesus says, few find it, few find that road. Let me give you this analogy. Think about two groups of people traveling. One is a tourist who's headed to this lovely country where they want to go and experience the beauty of that country. This tourist has, the program is in their hand. They decide when they want to go. They've got options how they'll get there, when they'll get there, when they'll stay, where they'll stay, how long they will stay. If it gets rough, they can pull out because they can go to another country and they can go to another destination. They've got options. They pack and they travel with what they need to take, and they buy some more, and they go back wherever they came from. That's one traveler going to one country. There's another traveler who's a desperate migrant. They need to move from where they are because it's impossible to stay, and they need to go to this other place where they will be rehomed. That's the plight of many asylum seekers. That's the plight of many refugees. That's the plight of many, many economic migrants that are looking for hope elsewhere. They have no choice. They have no say. They are at the mercy of the receiving country. The rules to enter a different country are so stringent. They're so hard. There's no wiggle room. The country says, jump, you, have, you ask how high. You don't negotiate. It is costly. You leave everything behind if you want to take that path. Sometimes you leave your friends. Sometimes you leave your family. You take nothing with you because you can only but travel light. <coughs> Many times as Christians, we live as stories because we think we have a choice and we think we want options and we think we want to make the rules and we want to enjoy the path. Now, maybe. But Jesus says that the way I invite you, the way that leads to life, it's a way that is narrow and that is different. A lot of people who also reject Christ, reject him on the same basis. They're happy on the road that they are going. And we see many people journey in that way. But what does the narrow road mean for us? The first thing it means, which is very unpopular, is that the narrow road is only accessible through Christ. 
There's no other way. It's so narrow because there's no other option. You cannot get uncomfortable with Jesus and still be on the narrow road. There is no another road. It does not have an exit plan. It's Jesus. He has to be the Lord. He has to be the one through whom we shall go. He said very unapologetically, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. Jesus never apologized for that. We shouldn't. We should not give people an illusion that there's an option outside Christ. In John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus said to Nicodemus, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. And we are born in Christ and through the sacrifice that Jesus gave. The road is narrow because it's either Jesus or nothing. The road is also narrow because it is a road that is marked with repentance and with hardship. Repentance has become one of those words that we no longer talk much about. And imagine how unpopular it is to tell somebody, for you to enter the kingdom of heaven, you need to first and foremost acknowledge you're a sinner. This road only those who know they are sinners are the ones who will find it. In fact, it says, few find it. Few know they are sin. Few understand the depth and the ugliness of their sin. And they fall on their knees and ask for mercy. If this road has no repentance, then you are not. If your road has no repentance, then most likely you are not on the right way. And that is true for the ones who are also in Christ and thinking that they are walking. Because as we are walking towards Christ, not that Christians and believers don't sin, but because we know we are on this road and we want to end up in the right place, then that sin will grieve us. And that sin will send us into repentance. And that sin will send us into the place of asking and pleading for mercy because we know there's no other way and we are desperate migrants. We want to make it. We will ask God forgiveness. We will know when we go astray because the road is narrow. The rules are clear. When we break them, we know them. But we always have this nice little phrase. You know, God will understand. Now the question is, do you understand that the road is narrow? It is stringent. It is tight. The choices have been made for us. Obedience is required. It is a narrow, narrow road. Amen. There are two groups. Amen. Jesus says that the narrow path is taken only by a few. Of course, who wants the hardships? And who wants the rules? Some people have to walk solo. And sometimes that's what it means. It is unpopular. So again, there are no trophies along the way and cheerleaders along the way. But the wide way, because it's easy, then everyone takes that road. It is popular. And people want to take that route. Now, the sad part is that there are many Christians who want to live their lives interpreting the scripture, interpreting the word of God, interpreting the rules of the Lord and the way of a Christian life according to what pleases the masses. And we want to walk on the wide path but end up on the narrow gate somehow. Because we want the people to celebrate the things we do. We want to tell the gospel in a way that's palatable and palatable and acceptable. The things that Jesus said that were so hard to say, we, we can't say them that way because it's not popular. And the way Jesus asked us to live, we can sort of like change a little bit so that we stop being unpopular, but somehow end up in the narrow gate. Somehow. It doesn't work that way. And I feel like I need to repent on behalf of ministers like me and preachers who have peddled a soft gospel and invited people to receive a false Christ. The one who is just nice. The one who is just kind. The one who is just 
come to Jesus and he will make your life happy and he will give you blessings and he will make your life just look much better. Rather than striving, we're inviting people to stroll with Jesus. And there are a lot of people who've said yes to the gospel because we told them, come, Jesus will make it easy. <clears throat> and I'm really sorry if you have not yet reconciled with a Christian life that is marked with suffering. Because for many people, as soon as life starts getting harder, they lose their faith because suddenly they think God has left them. The problem is we introduce them to the wrong God. Our God knows suffering and he's with us in the suffering. And therefore, if our road is marked with suffering, it's because he himself walked the road of suffering. That's the right God. And as a Christian, if your life is hard, whether because of persecution or pain or lack or illness or whatever tragedy the human race goes through, we know our God is with us and is asking us to stick on that narrow road because he's chosen it for us and he knows, he knows it is hard. Many people, unfortunately, are on the wide road thinking they will end up in the narrow gate. You see, sometimes in the quickness of wanting people to accept Christ and we get excited when people say, yes, I want to receive Jesus Christ, we don't share the full gospel with them. I'm thinking about our missionaries who come and share stories of how they serve in areas where Christianity is not um, acceptable in those countries. We expect that our missionaries will be kind enough and loving enough to tell the people in that country that if you say yes to Jesus, it will cost you a lot. We expect that they will tell them, say yes to Jesus, but you might lose your family. Your government might imprison you. The radicals might kill you. And then ask them again, do you want to receive Jesus? But why do we preach that gospel to them, but not to us? Why is that gospel only fit for them and not for us? Why is it that we invite people to receive a Jesus that is only nice, and when Jesus reminds us he's holy, people walk away? Joshua chapter 24, <clears throat> verse 14. It is interesting that children of Israel had just reached the promised land, and they've entered the promised land, and now they're going to go and occupy the places that God had designated for them. And Joshua at that point stands <laughs> and tell the children of Israel, I need you guys to make a choice. And so he says, now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. And he says, put away the gods of your fathers, the ones that they served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. And then he says this, and if you find this offensive, if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, then choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers, the ones that they serve in the regions beyond the river, um, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwelt. And then Joshua says, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, do you know what the children of Israel said? Let's see the next slide. And the people answered, far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord and serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us out of the land of our fathers. I mean, uh, brought us and our fathers up from the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. And it is him who did those great signs in our sight. And he preserved us. This is a good God. See how he has blessed us. Therefore, we will also serve the Lord alongside you. Now, if I was Joshua the preacher at that point, I would have been like, that altar call has received an immediate yes. Because the people said, we will serve the Lord, we have seen his mighty works. Joshua doesn't take it at face value. He asks them. But Joshua said to the people, you're not able to serve the Lord. For he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgression or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then that God who you say preserved you, he will turn around and consume you. 
after having done you good? Then Joshua asked, who will you serve? In the next verse, and the people say to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. Now, if I was a preacher, I'd be like, okay, there is no confirmation. Joshua pushes harder because he knows that this decision is a big one. It's a life and death decision. You don't choose God and still hold on to other gods. Joshua presses in and asks them and he says to them, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. And the people listen and they said, we are witnesses. Do we preach that way? When somebody says, yes, I want to become a Christian, do we pause and ask them, do you understand what you're saying? Are you ready to be the person who walks in loneliness on the narrow road serving no other God but this God alone? Do we do that? And then Joshua finishes off by saying, then put away the foreign gods that are among you and incline your heart to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people say to Joshua, the Lord our God, we will serve him and his voice, we will obey. And when Joshua finishes this off, um, just keep going, Jackie, let me just finish it off. And so Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and he put um, in place statues, statutes and rules for them at Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words on the book of law. And then he took a large stone and he set it there under the terror beneath. That was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And that stone, do you know what it was for? Behold, this stone, Joshua says, shall be a witness against us, for it has heard the words that the Lord spoke to us. Therefore, this stone shall be a witness against you, lest you deal falsely with your God. Then Joshua let the people go. It's almost like doing an altar call five times to the same person who said yes. And ask them, will you obey, will you follow, will you obey, will you follow. Friends, when we sign up to be Christians, Jesus is asking us to be the few. And he knows many will not find it. And he did not apologize for it. Whom do you serve? Which gospel have you believed with Jesus? Did you say yes to? Very quickly, I'll talk about the two gates. The gate is analogous to judgment. The Bible has never been shy that one day there will be a time when reckoning comes, when people will have to give account to the Lord. In John chapter 10, Jesus identifies himself as the gate. It's interesting that when people make it eventually to heaven, that place of life, it will be through Christ. He is he is the gate. But the other thing that we also forget, friends, is that the people who will end up in hell will end up in hell because God will send them there. Judgment is a choice that God does as his prerogative, as a father, as a God, as a creator, and the sustainer of the universe. He is a holy God and sin will be punished. Jesus said many times, over and over again, there will be those who will enter life and those who will say, away, depart from me, I knew you not. And you will notice that from this point forward in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus will continue dividing people into twos. There will be false prophets and the right prophets. There will be the right disciples, the people who follow Jesus for real. And there will be the ones Jesus will say, I don't know you. And then there'll be those who will build on a foundation that's Christ. And then there'll be the ones who will build on sinking sand. And every time Jesus will keep saying, what will you choose? What will you choose? Because there will be a way that is good and a way that is bad. There will be a gate that will lead to life and there'll be one that leads to eternal damnation. You see, friends, sometimes we think that it is abominable or abhorrent to think of a good God punishing sin. Or to think of a good God sending people to hell. Like, why? Why is that even in the Bible? God, you need to change this to be a little bit more popular. And the problem is because often 
when we look at the cross, we see a picture of what we are worth, and that is true. But this is what sometimes and often we fail to see. We fail to see at the cross a picture of how detestable our sin is. And if God allowed Christ to go through the cross, all that God will punish sin for those who reject the cross and the way of the cross. And so if we think that God will not deal harshly eventually with sin, all we need to do is take a second look at the cross and know for sure that he will. And that's why our gospel to many people, we tell people, oh, God loves you. But we fail to tell them, go and sin no more. We fail that. And when we fail that, we don't point them to the gate that leads to eternal life. The final one is a destination. I, I love pulling surprises, okay? My kids will tell you that I am almost the queen of surprises. Everything is a surprise. Okay. And, and, and they've learned to go with this phrase of like, Mom, tell us, tell us, tell us. I'll be like, just trust me, just trust me. All my surprises are really nice. And they're like, yeah. And they have, based on my trust, they will wait. And then the moment when the surprise is unleashed, the joy, the glee, you know, they're like, ah, you know, and, and they're kind of glad they waited. Well, <coughs> Jesus still loves us, but he doesn't keep the destination a surprise. The people who will enter through the wide gates, they will know exactly where they're going because Jesus has described and has said it. The people who will enter through the narrow gate, they will not be surprised because, or at least they should, and Jesus has said, and he knows what exactly will be on that side of life. And Jesus says, you must choose. Because when you don't choose for Christ, then chances are you are choosing against him. And Jesus gave some absolutes here. We don't like absolutes. It's one of those things we'd rather change about God. We don't like ultimatums. We don't like to be told that it's this way or the highway. But Jesus gave us. And he said that the kingdom of God is not seeker sensitive. It's not nice and kind. It is hard and you have a choice to take it. But what a blunder if you don't. Oh, how sad it will be for the person who does not take the kingdom of God through the narrow way. Because this is what Jesus defines as one of the destinations of the places that people will end up going to. Jesus says, uh, the Bible teaches us that the place called hell, the place called destruction, where that narrow gate leads to, it is a place where the fire is never quenched. It is a place where the worm never dies. It is a place where there is weeping and crying and there's no enough tears to wet their eyes. It is a place where there is gnashing of teeth. It's the searing of your teeth and greeting them in anger and maybe even regret so deep, so painful, it consumes you to the point you want the mountains to fall on you and crush you so that it can stop and the mountains will not fall on you and it goes again and again and over and over. And when you think you've had enough, it goes on. The wailing is unsufferable because there's no hope. There's no rescue. Now tell me, what a cruel person would not tell you that something like this exists and they know you're going there. How unkind it would have been for Jesus not to tell us about this hell that exists so that we can know and we can be warned about it. When we fail to tell people about it, we think we're being kind to them. But Jesus loved us too much not to warn us about the gate that leads to this destination that is destruction. 
But I don't want to end on a hell of a note. <laughs> the narrow gate, though. Jesus says, enter by this gate. Friends, it is that beautiful, wonderful place. Every time you and I have buried a loved one that we love so much, we long to see their faces again. Imagine that place where you will have this joy renewed when you see that loved one that you have missed so much. And then now imagine it this way, that that joy will pale in comparison to the joy you will feel when you behold the face of your Savior. It is joy. It is a bursting of song and gladness that knows no end. And you know why? Because sorrow can't touch you. There's no weeping. There is no pain. There is no disease. There's no suffering. It is joy. When you think the song is over, another one starts. My friend, that is a road that awaits the one who did not quit the narrow way. What a loving God. There are no surprises he's told us. He has told you. He has told me. My invitation to each one of us, no matter how hard the road has been for you, or no matter how hard the road will be for you going ahead, stick it out. Stay on the narrow way. Enter the narrow gate. Let's pray. Our Father and our Lord, we are thankful because you are a good God. In your mercy, Lord, you have chosen to redeem us and to love us, we wretched sinners. Father, we pray that the Holy Spirit will convict us truly of our own sin and of our own guilt and of our own unrighteousness. And we can cry out again to you, Lord, forgive me a sinner. Forgive me a sinner and receive me, O oh Lord, in your eternal grace. Lord, I pray for each one of us here, for anyone who may have followed you wondering why is life so hard in Christ and now they are wondering whether they took a good gospel. I pray for your mercy, that your love will grab them and that they will come and that they will follow you and that they will stay. I pray for anyone who's never truly, truly given their lives to you, oh God, choosing to serve you but still hold on to the foreign gods, <clears throat> choosing to want you but wanting to stay in the easy wide life of choices and sin and worldly pleasure. Lord, I pray for that person who thinks they are a Christian but they are not yet. Have mercy because what is a stake is too much. May you, O oh Lord, who said you will send your Holy Spirit to convict us of sin, of judgment and of righteousness. May your spirit convict our hearts and bring us to our knees until we say, yes, Lord, we will choose you. We will serve you. And Father, I pray, may you give us the grace that will allow us to fix our eyes on Christ and to keep walking till the day Christ comes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>